All right. Hey, I'm Matt. I'm from Zurb, and I'm going to talk to you guys about super awesome jQuery interactions. Uh, if I get too loud, just let me know. I get really excited when I talk about stuff like this in jQuery, and I also talk really fast. So hopefully, guys, you can keep up. Uh, this talk's going to be a little bit different about than what you guys have heard so far. We've been talking a lot about how to do things with jQuery. This is more about what you guys are doing with jQuery. So let's just jump right into it. All right, I don't need to guys tell you guys this, but jQuery is awesome, right? Clearly, you guys all know that. You wouldn't be here at this conference. But with great power comes great responsibility. And sometimes we put things, functionality, that seems like it's going to be really cool, but what ends up happening is we deliver a really bad interaction for our <laughs> users, right? People get burned by bad interactions, and it makes them feel like this. Ah, God, it feels bad. I'm out of control. I'm not doing what the application should be doing. And we want them to feel like this, happy, zen, in control of what they're doing. Uh, feeling really good about the application, about your brand, about other things that you do. That's what we're striving for. So how do we make users feel better about our applications? Well, we could you know, show them cool YouTube videos like this one. This is awesome. You guys have all seen this. We could take them on a magical journey to Candy Mountain with Charlie the Unicorn. Everyone's seen this dozens of times. There's no sound. Sorry. Or we can stick to these four interaction principles. Right? So four things I'm going to cover today. First, do no harm. Come on. Do no harm to your users. There's been a lot of talk this weekend about progressive enhancement, the key word being enhancement. If you're adding JavaScript, it needs to make the experience better. You can't disable any of the stuff that you should just have on the web, like clicking links, moving my mouse around. If I can't do that, you're making life worse for me. Second, we need to understand response times. JavaScript is a lot faster than a regular page load, and there's some things we need to be sensitive to, and I'm going to go into more detail about that. Thirdly, we need to communicate. And I'm not talking about big red text on the page and pop-ups but subtle communications using cursor states to explain to the user what they can and can't do on the application without hitting them over the head with a lot of text, because nobody really likes to read. And then anticipation. We need to anticipate what they're doing so we don't fire events, fire pop-ups without them really wanting to do that. So let's go back to that first one and dig into do no harm. Uh, this poor Lego guy has been torn apart by bad interactions. And let's take a look at a couple of them. Here's cnnmoney.com. If I come to the site from the URL bar, my mouse is going to be up at the top, and there's a DAO link right there. I'm really interested in the DAO today. I want to click some more details about that. So if I take my mouse and move it to the DAO, what happens? Ooh, blocked by the nav. Terrible, right? I have to move away for it to go away, and then I can get back to the link. Again, something that I should just be able to do on the site. I'll show it to you guys one more time. I should be able to just go and click on that link. I can't do it. The nav gets in the way because it pops before it should. And I know that's a JS nav and not a CSS nav because there was a delay for it to close, but there was no delay for it to open. All right. If I'm reading how to build decorative draft stoppers that look like cats, something that I do every day, by the way, I'm just reading this article, minding my own business. As I move the mouse around, I barely hit that link and it pops open. You see, I barely just hit the side of it and this ad pops open. Right? Uh, if I click away, it doesn't close. I have to target that tiny X and click on that to get rid of it. That's just not fun. Again, down there with the kitty. Right? We have to have ads to generate revenue. I understand that. I'm not saying don't make ads. But don't pop an ad when a user is trying to do something else. Because then they feel like they opened the ad. They weren't showing any interest in those links at all. They were just trying to read the article. Okay? That makes me feel really not good about this stuff. Okay, here's my favorite. This is the Otter Pop website. This is a little bit of a contrived example. But uh, we love Otter Pops. And here I want to learn more about these delicious freezer bars. So I click on the freezer bar, open it up. And here's a carousel. We've all seen carousels before. And on the right, you'll notice there's an arrow with the cursor state. Uh, Okay, or the pointer, indicating I should be able to click on it. It's a nice, bright blue arrow. I should be able to click on that, right? If I click, nothing. If I click a lot, no matter how hard I click, nothing happens. Okay. But if I explore over to the left, oh, it moves, wait, what? It moves the wrong way. And then if I go that way, it moves the other way. So I have to go and like chase stuff to the left and the right. Uh, that just is bizarre, right? But if you think about the person, I'm trying to get in the head of the person who did this. They were thinking about it from the perspective of the carousel and not from the perspective of the person using the carousel. Right? If I click on the right arrow, the carousel should move right. right? And the left arrow, the carousel should move left. Right? No, that's wrong. That's what's implemented here. Really, if I'm exploring to the right, you should be revealing to the right by moving the carousel to the left. So when you guys are building things and designing these interactions, and by the way, you're all interaction designers, even though you're not part of the design process, when you implement something, you're designing all those details that weren't thought out before. Think about it from the person using the application's perspective and not just about the functionality that you're building, right? And you'll make everybody a lot happier. All right, so I want to talk about speed. Faster is not always better. Uh, 
This has been documented long before the web, but users have very specific reactions to different response times. I'm going to talk about those in four different categories right now, four different intervals. So if we think about this, we can um, generate better interactions. So the response times I'm talking about are covered in detail in an article. I'll link to it in the notes, but I don't want to get to that right now. So any interaction that takes less than 100 milliseconds makes the user feel like they're in direct control of what's going on. They're directly controlling the data. There's no shared control between them and the application. Just like in this case, our axe-wielding Lego person is in direct control of the guy he's standing on top of. As I'm moving through my operating system, navigating through my file structure, everything I click on is 100, 100 milliseconds, right? I feel like I'm directly moving through it, and I feel good about that. If it takes more than 100 milliseconds to do something, expand a folder, I don't like that. It doesn't feel good, okay? I'm going to show you an example of a quick interaction. It's really fast, so pay attention. Okay, under 100 milliseconds. That could have been two pages because it's, it could have been a page load, but that would be, you know, one, two, three seconds in there. Instead, we want to make it really fast, so I click and it flies away with a little animation. Yay, that's great. Again, we want to make the user feel like they're moving through effortlessly. It's something where there's no data being saved, so we don't need to give them that shared control perspective. Just take them to the next page immediately. So let me show you how that feels across a couple pages. Click, it flies away. I'm free to go here, add a note to this page. OK, that flies away. Go to the next step. It's just a really nice flow with no page loads. And it's a big difference between 100 milliseconds and three seconds. And you can see that I'm just going through this. Feels really nice. Okay, so here's how we do this. There's uh, been some talk about eventing your entire application. That's awesome. You don't need to event the whole thing. If you just want to event a part of your application like we're doing here, we do a dirty little trick where we're just stacking all the divs when the first page loads. First one's shown, the other ones are hidden. This is just some of our Rails code to show you that we load everything when the first page loads. And then we use a click event that fires this fade out and slide animation that we wrote that just fades out and slides the div. When that's complete, we have a custom event that fires this with instructions event we bind to down here, which will fade it and slide the next one. So very low tech stuff. We're just chaining events together so we can get that effect of moving through really quickly without doing page loads. Um, again, we're not eventing it where we don't want to have to go out and get the next page. We want to have them all loaded in that first page. So obviously, if this is like a 50 step thing, you're going to blow out the size of that original page. But if it's small enough, you can preload everything so that you're guaranteed that as they're moving through the steps, they dismiss immediately. And you Guaranteed to go in 100, 100 milliseconds. All right, 100 milliseconds to one second. The user no longer feels they're directly controlling the data. Now it's shared control between them and the application. Just like up here, our Lego man has the ax, but now the Lego man's running away. There's a little bit of shared control in this whole you know, murder chase type deal. I'm going to show you the same thing again. There's two clicks. Pay attention. Can anybody tell me the difference between those two clicks? One more time, or maybe we're just getting bad participation here. Two clicks, one, two. What was the difference? Anybody? Yes, the second one was slower. The second one was over 100 milliseconds, and it's not because the server was slow, it's because we actually put a 100 millisecond delay in there. So for the first one, it's a navigation. I'm moving from the instructions to the next step. Make it instantaneous. But for the second one, I'm putting a note on the page, so I need to feel like the computer did something like there was a save there, right? So that's why we're actually pushing the interaction by adding a delay. We could do it asynchronously and just uh, save it later, but we actually put the delay in on purpose to make sure that the user gets that feeling. If you just fly away immediately, they feel like that's happening too quickly. So again, for navigation, go under 100 milliseconds. If it's something that has to have the user think, you know, they want to think the computer or the application did something, put a little delay in there so that they feel like something happened. Okay, more than one second, but less than 10 seconds. This is where most page loads, this is the range they're usually in. You can get your page to load in under a second, you are awesome, um, but most of the time it's gonna be over a second. As you pass the second boundary, the user is starting to lose flow on what they're doing. So like when you're coding, you're in the flow, you're in the zone. Just with people using your applications, they have the same kind of thing, that focus. As you get past one second, if they click on something, they're waiting more than a second, they're starting to disengage a little bit. As long as they stay under 10 seconds, they're not going to lose focus on the whole dialogue. But the farther you get away from one second, the more flow they're using. They're losing. Excuse me. So that's why it's important to get our page loads as close to one second as we can. Um, obviously, that's really fast. Two seconds is pretty good. But I'm going to show you an example of one of our pages and verify. It's a pretty heavy page for us on the database side. We have to load this whole click map and stuff. 
but we still want it to come in as quick as possible, so I'll show you how this loads when you reload it. So you can see what happens there. We actually kind of cheat. Rather than loading the whole page at once, we load the page, and then we defer the actual load of the click map into an AJAX request. So we're cheating because what the user wants is the click map, but it's okay to delay it because psychologically they saw the page load, so their click from the other page to this page came back in about a second and a half. And I can blow that up so you can see that. So down in the bottom right-hand corner, the onload for the page fired in one and a half seconds. Pretty quick. Even though the two AJAX requests that we had to do to pull the click stuff and filter it took another two seconds. There's a 900 millisecond one and a 900 millisecond one down there. So if we had put it all on one page request, we're looking at a three and a half second page load as opposed to a one and a half second page load, which is a huge difference when the user's clicking through a lot of pages and trying to stay in the flow of what they're doing. All right, for file uploads, uh, I'm just gonna say you guys shouldn't be uploading files in forums with posts anymore. You need to be doing this stuff all with AJAX, and I'll show you why. If the user's uploading a file with a form, they select their file, they click submit, and depending on how large the file is, you have no control over this, they could end up waiting 10, 20 seconds, depending on their internet and the size of the file, before they get any kind of responses to what happened. It looks like your page is slow, something may be broken. Obviously, you know, savvy users here, we know that if we attach a large file, it's gonna take a long time to upload, but not all users know that. So I'm gonna show you how we do this here with AJAX. Just gonna click on that, and as soon as I click on open, we're gonna replace the thumb with the spinner icon. This communicates that something's happening with the image, it's uploading on the thumbnail, that's why I'm waiting, and when it's done, we replace it with the thumbnail of the image you just uploaded. It both tells you that it's done uploading and it confirms that we uploaded the file you just selected. So if you don't have a preview in your dialogue when you're selecting the image, you now get a preview so you know what you uploaded. If you have to upload five or six images, you can then see what they all are. And if you need to come to this page later and edit stuff, you obviously have the visual reference right there of what you selected. We're using an existing plugin for this, the Valence plugin. I'll show you the link for that in just a second for the AJAX image upload. And we're hooking on to the on submit callback. So pretty straightforward. On submit is when the file is selected. We're adding a loading class that puts that little spinner on top of the thumbnail, the placeholder thumbnail. The nuance here to notice is that don't remove the loading class until the new thumbnail is actually loaded. So we're binding the load event in the thumbnail before we swap out the source. And that way you avoid this really annoying flicker effect when it comes back. You'll see a flick from the other one. So just note that small thing. Um, there's the link to the plugin. It's the Valums AJAX upload plugin. Again, I'll post it with all the notes. And then we also have a playground page that goes through this technique in detail. If you guys have any, are curious and seeing how this works and breaks down each line of the code. So you know what's going on there. If anything takes more than 10 seconds, that's just depressing. I mean, this poor Lego guy, he's been waiting for his apps to load. He's drinking, he's growing some stuff on his face. It's just really sad. But some stuff just takes more than 10 seconds. If it does, you have two different options. You either need to tell the user exactly how long it's gonna take for the task to complete, or you need to give them something else to do to distract them in the meantime. In the latter case, you still need to be coming back pretty quick. It's, it's often really hard to predict how fast something's gonna be on the web, depending on what you're doing. So in this case of Bounce, we chose the latter option. Balance lets you put in a URL, and then we're gonna go out and grab a screenshot of that page. We're not just grabbing the viewport, we're grabbing the whole document. So depending on how big it is, it could take us a while to grab it. New York Times is obviously gonna be quite a bit larger than Google, and we can't really give you an estimate. So when you click on the grab screenshot button, oh sweet, a bouncing ball. It's nice, it's red, it's bouncing, how fun. Uh, it's got a little shine on there, it stops, a little bit of gravity, if I click on it, it bounces again, and before you know it, the page loads and the user's been distracted, so that's a good trick. <laughs> that's a good trick to do something fun. We actually experimented with putting a YouTube video there, but the users got too engaged in the video and they didn't want to go to the next page, so that's why we pulled that out. So just a little animation like that, that's something we're starting to use. And obviously the jQuery code for this is very straightforward. We just have a function. It's making an AJAX call saying, is it done? The AJAX call comes back. The first time we're scheduling it for three seconds because we know a lot of them come back in three seconds. If it's gonna take longer, it's gonna take longer. So we'll schedule a check every five seconds after that. All right, communication. I talked this a little bit before. Communication is really important on apps and not just throwing a lot of text on the page. So here. This person is kind of waving her hand, saying hello, and he's, he's doing something else. He's not interested, right? So you need to communicate in the way that users are expecting it without 
the waving your hands and telling them, because people tend to ignore that. It's just like banner blindness. You give them too many instructions, they're not going to follow them. So here's a, a page on balance after we've loaded it. I have a, a note annotation, and I want to communicate to the user that they need to type in some text in that text area before they can save the note. So rather than tell them that, I have a disabled state for the button. So it's grayed out. If I hover over it, there's no hover state. My cursor is the default cursor, indicating that I probably can't do anything with it. If I click on it, nothing happens. There's no active state. But once I type in text, we enable the input. And when I hover over it, it has an active state. I'm sorry, a hover state. It's now showing the pointer, indicating that I should click on this to save it. And when I do, it does. So we've told that to the user without doing anything besides implement all this little piece. We use no text to do that, OK? If you're going to do JavaScript validation for stuff, make sure you hit all the weird little edge cases, especially with text. Um, don't just bind to the, the key up, key down. Make sure you bind to copy, or I'm sorry, cut and paste. So when we cut and paste, it disables, it checks it on those two things as well. This is a pattern we kept doing over and over again. And doing the cut and paste across different browsers is a little tricky. So we wrote a plugin for that. Here's what the code looks like to hook it up. We add two more events to um, jQuery that you can bind to. There's no convenience method, so you need to use the actual bind event. So we have a has text method. This fires when the element goes from not having text to having text. And then the other side, you can bind to a no text event that only fires when it goes from having text to not having text. You can disable the element. So we have a page up. Again, this will be in the notes where you can go download the plugins on GitHub, fork it, do whatever terrible things you want to do it. All right, I want to go back to this example before the image upload. You may or may not have noticed, but when I click open, that button in the bottom right-hand corner goes to a disabled state, and it says uploading. So if you try to click on that, you can't, and you know why you can't, because it's still uploading. That's what the button said. So we did use a little bit of text here, but it was pretty unobtrusive. OK, so I talked a little about cursor states. I want to show you how we use cursor states for bounce. Um, on the bounce page, you add notes by clicking and dragging. But we don't show you how to do that or tell you how to do that. We just kind of hint at it by using different cursor states. So as soon as my mouse moves onto the cursor, I'm sorry, onto the image, it becomes the crosshair, indicating that I should click and drag. So when I click and drag, it makes a note. All right? When I come over to the note now, we have the move cursor indicating that I should click and drag to move it. I can click and drag to move it. We have these two nice little white nubs in the bottom left, so we're using the southeast cursor on that, indicating click and drag to resize, southwest cursor on the other side, click and drag to do that one. If I mouse over that X in the top right, I have the pointer, indicating that's something I can click on. We already talked about the OK button being disabled now with the default cursor. When it's enabled, it goes to the pointer. And when I save the note and now go back over the note, it's a pointer indicating that I need to click on that now to go back into the editing state. I click on it, we go back into the editing state. There is one discoverability issue with uh, crosshair. People may not know click and drag, so we also bind to just click. If you click, we just create a note right where you clicked, and we expand it out a little bit. And then from there, you can move it and resize it to get it into the shape that you want it. So, yar, just like the OOCSS pie I was talking about yesterday, the best way to organize this stuff is to put it in the CSS, don't put it in the JavaScript. We maintain the state of the note using classes, and then that's a really easy way for us to just go in the CSS and define what the cursor state should be for each of those states. So um, pretty straightforward to see that right here. When the note is being created, we hide the note body. For a read-only note, the cursor is going to be the default one for the overlay because you can't click on it to edit it, and so forth. Keep it out of the JavaScript. All right. It can be a little tricky. I know you guys can't read this. It can be a little tricky to find all these different areas where you can communicate what's going on. So one methodical way to do it is to use something. This is um, a tool coined by Bill Scott. It's called the Interesting Moments Grid. You make this table. Along the top side, you list all of the different actions that can happen as part of your interaction. So I know you can't, can't read this, but it's things like the text area becomes populated. You click OK. You cancel the note. And on the left column, you list all of the different actors. So these are all the different components of the note. It's the note overlay. It's the little nubs. It's the actual note text itself. And then you go through each one of these cells, and you see if it makes sense for you to um, do something to indicate what it is. So like what the cursor states are for all these different pieces. So here we have 110 possible interesting moments where we can communicate something with the user. We actually use 39 of those just for that little note interaction that you saw right now. All right.
There's a link. We have a blog post diving more into this interesting moment stuff. Phil Scott also has a really good book on interactions by O'Reilly. Um, at least since you guys have seen this stuff. So, all right. So if communication's not enough, we can always resort to precognition. Right? <laughs> Anticipating the user's thoughts. Uh, obviously, we can't actually read their minds, and the precogs haven't quite evolved yet. So what we can do is put a broadcast delay. So just like when you listen to the radio and the DJ swears too much, they can back it up a little bit. We can do the same thing in JavaScript, where we can use set timeout to put small delays around things and make sure that we don't start an action until the user actually intended us for us to do that action. So again, I'm showing the nav here. So here we have a two-tier navigation, primary nav on the top, secondary nav on the bottom. The page we're on now is a search page, which is why that's selected and that secondary nav is shown. And I can move freely across this nav without it doing any kind of twitchy stuff or moving. It's not until I stop on something that it actually opens a secondary nav, which now I can then move around no problem. If I you know, accidentally flick off it for a second, that's OK. There's timeout there, too. And it's not until I show interested in another one, that one's go back. Once I leave the nav, it goes back to the default one, but not too quickly. I mean, something that seems really simple, like this nav, it ends up being a little more complex than you would think to get these little small details right. So here's the code for this. The trick is to use two different set timeouts. We use one to activate and one to deactivate. So that's when your mouse goes over and when your mouse goes out. So the nav li, those are those primary li items across the top. Whenever you enter your mouse in any one of those, you clear both timeouts, and then you set a timeout for half a second before you activate the one that you're on. So in this case, activate tab is the method that's going to activate the item that we're currently hovering over and activate its subnav and deactivate all the other ones. When they leave an li item, you need to activate the originally selected one after waiting half a second. 500 milliseconds is what we found to be about the level of user intention. So it, it sounds a little slow, and if you're like doing it and developing it, it may feel a little slow. But users tend to find that if they're exploring stuff, 500 seconds is about the level of intention. Some people say 400. I don't know. You can play with it a little bit. But I like the, the 500 millisecond. It's the sweet spot. All right. This is Yahoo News. Same thing. We have those nasty links. But if I move over them, I can move over them freely. If I hover, it opens. If I hover off, it closes pretty quickly. I don't need to target the X to get rid of it. Um, why am I showing Yahoo? Because if you went here a month ago, you would have seen something like that other site. As soon as you touched any nav, it opened this big old pop-up, and it was nasty right on the Yahoo homepage. But they got in here, and they fixed it before I could capture my presentation, which was unfortunate. But it does show that large companies are getting this idea of design for people. They're thinking about what people want and not just designing for functionality. Um, Nobody wants to build bad experiences, right? But we tend to do it anyway because functionality drives what we're doing and not the people we're designing for. If you think about the people we're designing for, I think it's much more rewarding to make people happy than just giving them something that they need. They're going to suffer through a bad experience if you are the only person who can deliver that kind of functionality, but they're still not going to feel good about it. If you're trying to build a brand, you're trying to build a platform, many applications, they're not going to feel good about your other applications if this one sucks. Yeah, they'll still use it because you're the only game in town, they're not going to feel good about it, right? Building a brand and building a platform is really important. I mean, this is like the, the iPod you know, phenomenon. People have iPods. They love them. They're fun. There's great ads. They associate that to all Apple products. So I mean, everybody here has a MacBook. You all have iPods with, of course, some exceptions. Yeah, I see. All right. But you get the idea, all right? So if you like the idea of building cool stuff for people, making people happy, um, we're looking for somebody. Zerb.com slash talent. We're looking for a talented engineer type person, front and back and stuff. Come and talk to me. Check out zerb.com slash talent. You can go and see most of the stuff from the presentation right now at zerb.com slash jqconf. I have all of the stuff, um, all the videos on YouTube are there. I still have put in the code samples. I'm sorry, I'm slacking. But all the slides are on this link. And we'll update this with details. And I'll put some notes for the presentation, because the deck is obviously a little sparse for this stuff. But that is all that I have got for you.